good evening. I would like to call to order the regular meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, March the 22nd, 2022. On behalf of the members of the school board and the superintendent, I welcome each of you present and watching. A quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. As we open tonight's meeting, I want to take a few minutes to acknowledge the tragic loss of our Daily Press education reporter, Sierra Jenkins. Ms. Jenkins was assigned to cover education in November of 2021 and frequently attended these meetings to ensure our community was kept informed. Her fair and balanced reporting will be missed. Please join me in a moment of silence in remembrance of Sierra Jenkins. Thank you. We will now move on to the invocation and pledge of the flag. Here to do the honors is a student from Richneck Elementary School, Kara Risher. Kara Risher, would you please come forward? Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, before you get started. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kara Risher. I'm a fifth grade student in the Shriners class at Richneck Elementary. I'm a proud member of the school's uh, principal's advisory committee and archery team. Our archery team won second place in the state finals, in our, and we are on our way to nationals. I want to share the poem, Your Best, by Barbara Vance. Your best. If you always try your best, then you'll never have to wonder about what you could have done if you summoned all your thunder. And if your best was not as good as you hoped it would be, you could still say, I gave today all that I had in me. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kira Risha. You did a wonderful job, and we wish you all the best in your national competition. Thank you. Supporting Kara tonight are members of her uh, family and her school family. We like to ask them to stand at this time so they can be recognized. The board appreciates the encouragement you've given uh, Kara Risher, and we thank you for bringing her to tonight's meeting. We ask you to uh, please don't run off yet because we want to take a picture with you, okay, after <laughs> more recognitions. Uh, but at this time, we do have some uh, recognitions because, uh, Dr. Parker, I understand we have celebrities in our midst. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We'll get forth with our recognitions this evening. Not as impressive as impressive as our honorees. But <laughs> this evening, we have the honor and privilege of recognizing some outstanding student athletes. During the Virginia High School League State Indoor Track Meet, February 28th and March 1st, the Heritage High School Girls Indoor Track Team earned the 2022 Class 4 State Championship with a final yeah. score of 51 points. Yeah. Tonight, we are honored to recognize these talented student athletes. As I call your name, please come forward. Please join the school board and the superintendent in congratulating Kara Ashley. Marquette Fitzgerald. Destiny Kelly. Kinesia Neal. Nicole Lee Simmons. Mazane Solomon. Madison White.
Sabria Wooden. And Sanai Wooden. And let me round out the team. There were a few ladies that couldn't join us this evening. So we would also like to congratulate Anasti Brown, Tyla Clark, um, Jalazy Gomez Cherry. Did I get that right one? Um, Ebony Jackson. Um, is it Delaya Tatum? Please give those ladies um, a round of applause as <laughs> like to acknowledge their coaches. Would you please come forward? Um, head coach Jacqueline Bateman. Uh, and assistant coaches Ray Pollard and Chantel Powell. Coach Pollard. So we're presenting these young ladies and Heritage High School with a resolution of recognition, which reads, the Newport News School Board resolution of recognition honoring the Heritage High School girls indoor track team as the Virginia High School League Group 4 state champions. Whereas athletic competition enhances the moral and physical development of young people preparing them for the future by instilling in them the value of teamwork, encouraging a standard of healthy living, imparting a desire for success, and developing a sense of fair play and competition. And whereas excellence and success in competitive sports can be achieved only through hard work, practice, dedication, team play, and team spirit nurtured by dedicated coaching. And whereas, the Heritage High School girls indoor track team earned the 2022 Virginia High School Class 4 State Championship on February 28th and March 1st at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia with a final score of 51 points. And whereas with this victory, the Heritage Lady Canes won the first state girls indoor track title for their school and finished their season with an outstanding record. Whereas during the state meet, Madison White claimed individual state titles in the 55 meter dash and the 300 meter dash, Kara Ashley, Madison White, Sabria Wooten, and Sanai Wooten won the 1600 relay, and Kara Ashley, Mijane Solomon, Sabria Wooten, and Sanai Wooten teamed up to win the 800 relay, which contributed to the Lady Canes capturing Heritage High School's first state girls indoor track title. Right. Right. A little bit more. <laughs> Whereas the athletic talent displayed by this team is due in part to the efforts of coaches Jacqueline Bateman, Ray Pollard, and Chantel Powell, the support of the team's family and friends, and a host of other fans and supporters. Whereas the hallmark of the Lady Canes from the opening meet of the season to participating in the championship were a testament to athletic ability, good sportsmanship, honor, and scholarship, demonstrating that the team is determined and focused. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Newport News School Board congratulates the Heritage High School girls indoor track team on their state championship and outstanding record. In witness thereof, we have hereto set our hands and it is signed by the school board and the superintendent. Ladies, congratulations. All right. Absolutely. So I'm going to step aside and we're going to take a, a group picture.
switch. Okay. And there's more good news. On March 11th, the Minchville High School girls basketball team earned the 2022 Virginia High School Class 5 State Championship with a 59-36 victory wow. over Woodgrove yeah. High School's team at the single Center. Please join us in congratulating Kiara Bagwell, <laughs> Kiara Beal, <laughs> Jaylene Helms, <laughs> Kaylee Harrison. Jordan Hester, Sydney Robertson, Amari Smith, Haley Thomas, Riley Weaver, Atiana Williams, Talia Woodbury, Aaliyah Woodson, and Jayla Wright. And I'd also like to acknowledge head coach Adrian Webb. And assistant coaches, Jonathan Blass, Alfonso Hamilton, Sean Harrison, Rylan Harrison, Earl Hester, and Paul King. And I want to take um, just a moment to acknowledge an additional recognition. Uh, Amari Smith is named the Virginia High School League Class 5 Girls Basketball Player Ooh. of the Year. Adrian Webb was named the Virginia High School Class 5 Girls Basketball Coach right. of the Year. Now they too also have a resolution of recognition and I want to take a moment to read that as well. Resolution of recognition honoring Mintrell High School Girls Basketball Team 
as the Virginia High School League Class 5 state champions, whereas the Minchville High School girls basketball team earned the 2022 Virginia High School Class 5 state championship with a 59-36 victory over the previously unbeaten Woodgrove High School's team on March 11, 2022 at the Siegel Center in Richmond, Virginia. And whereas with this victory, the Minchville Lady Monarchs won the first state title in girls basketball in the school's history and finished their season with an outstanding record of 24-3. And whereas Amari Smith scored 17 points, Jalen Halmas scored 13 points, Atiana Williams scored 13 points, Kaylee Harrison scored six points, Aaliyah Woodson scored six points, Sydney Robertson scored two points, and Riley Weaver scored two points for a total of 59 points to capture the state championship. And whereas Amari Smith is named the Virginia High School League Class 5 Girls Basketball Player of the Year, and Amari Smith, Atiana Williams, and Aaliyah Woodson are named to the Virginia High School League Girls All-State Basketball Team. Wow. All right. And whereas the athletic talent displayed by this team is due in part to the efforts of head coach Adrian Webb, who is named the Virginia High School League Class 5 Girls Basketball Coach of the Year, and assistant coaches Jonathan Blass, Alfonso Hamilton, Sean Harrison, Rylan Harrison, Earl Hester, and Paul King, the support of the team's family and friends, and a host of other fans and supporters. And whereas the hallmarks of the Lady Monarchs from the opening game of the season to participation in the championship were a testament to athletic ability, good sportsmanship, honor, and scholarship, demonstrating that the team is determined and focused. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Newport News School Board congratulates the Minchville High School girls basketball team on their state championship, an outstanding team record, bringing honor and pride to Newport News Public Schools and the city of Newport News. Again, ladies, congratulations on this very well -made. Mr. Surrey, please come up. Squish in and get a picture. We had to, we had to stand up. Can you stay back against the yeah. things, yeah. and now the board members can stand up because we'll see them. Oh. Yes, and then coaches, can you go up there with them and fill in? Yes, you have to <laughs> Yeah, they are. Here, let me get this one. Well, I thought it was only because she Yeah. I'm holding the most important Yeah, we'll put it 
While the ladies are making their way back, I want to take a moment, I think Dr. Parker did this for me, but to acknowledge Heritage Principal Dr. Erling Hunter, the Athletic Director Jamie Plecker, and Minchville Principal Bobby Surrey, and Athletic Director Jenny Nuttycomb, and Mike Nichols, our Program Administrator of Youth Development, and all of the student athletes, family, and friends. Thank you so much, and congratulations. This concludes this evening's recognitions. Our viewing audience will have an opportunity to view this month's school board spotlight, so we'll stand in recess for about 10 minutes. Thank you. Every year, school and city leaders unify the efforts of a generous community to provide necessary school supplies for students. For the fifth year, the Re-Up School Supply Distribution provided a wealth of school supplies to students gearing up for the second half of the school year. This annual event is organized by City Councilman Marcellus Harris, School Board Member Marvin Harris, and Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and this year's re-up exceeded all expectations, impacting more students than ever before. For weeks, individuals and community partners donated school supplies to the worthy cause. This includes Lifehouse Church Newport News, who made the largest donation the re-up school supply distribution has ever received. During the month of January, the Lifehouse family went above and beyond donating brand new school supplies and monetary gifts to bless the students in Newport News. After being delayed by wintry weather, the re-up school supply distribution was able to adjust their original plans to get important school supplies into the hands of even more children. On a Saturday afternoon, the re-up supply drive was set up in two locations. Families were able to visit the original site at Denby Community Center to receive great appropriate supplies and free winter clothing. But with so many families visiting the city's first ever winter carnival, it made perfect sense to go to where the crowds were. In the parking lot of the old Kmart in Denby, Reup joined with Books on Bikes Newport News and the Newport News Youth Services Department to hand out over 800 bags of school supplies and hundreds of free books. Thanks to a number of caring individuals, community partners, and faith-based organizations, hundreds of students are fully equipped to finish the school year strong. Learning at home is where students build their love for becoming lifelong learners. Reading together is a time-honored tradition that helps students build a strong foundation in literacy, language, and comprehension, while allowing families to spend meaningful time together. For preschoolers and younger children, make reading time engaging and entertaining. Use different voices for each character or encourage your children to act out some of the action unfolding on each page, making the printed word come alive for your youngsters. Encourage your child to ask questions about the story and help them understand by making connections to their own lives. For your elementary age students, help them expand their vocabulary by reading more challenging books. Eventually, your children will be reading to you. Feel free to pause the story to ask insightful questions about what they see in the illustrations or make a hypothesis about what's going to happen on the next page. This expands the reading experience and encourages your child to connect with the literature on another level. Sure, reading to your child has a number of academic and developmental benefits. But for almost every kid, 
the love and memories formed while sitting closely and reading together are priceless. Fridays are extra special at Riverside Elementary. Besides the approaching weekend, students look forward to Firefighter Friday. On these special Fridays, Newport News firefighters offer a warm greeting to students that get dropped off by their parents in the morning. Lieutenant Marlon Pendergraft takes time each Friday to greet students and families with a warm smile and personally welcome each student to a great day of learning. When they're available, a fire truck from a nearby station joins Lieutenant Pendergraft with lights flashing and hands waving. Music teacher and current teacher of the year, Mitzi Imblich, is a founding member of the Citizen Fire Academy Alumni Association that supports the Newport News Fire Department. By forming this partnership, Riverside students put a friendly face to the firefighters who may arrive in the case of extreme emergencies, which could be a scary moment for the young students. This allows them to feel comfortable around these local heroes and know that their job is to help others. To show the firefighters how appreciative Riverside is of their time and commitment, Principal Karen Brown had the entire school write letters to the fire department during Random Acts of Kindness Week. For the younger grades, this was a wonderful activity to sharpen their vocabulary and writing skills. While the older grades worked on sentence structure and expressing emotion, some students were able to thank the firefighters for previously saving the lives of people they love. On a very special Firefighter Friday, a grateful team of students and staff presented their gifts to Fire Chief Jeff Johnson, Lieutenant Pendergraft, and members of Fire Station 10. Mrs. Emblich organized the thoughtful letters to be passed out to all 11 fire stations and each department, so Riverside's appreciation and kindness can spread to all of the hardworking heroes that serve in the Newport News Fire Department. Palmer Elementary is home to a unique course that helps non-English speaking students and refugees from other countries acclimate smoothly to life in the United States. The Newcomer Center at Palmer is one of four similar transition courses found across Newport News Public Schools that are designed to assist English language learners as they become proficient in speaking and writing the English language before graduating to their zoned school. To assist these students with their literacy growth and equip Palmer's classrooms with unique educational tools, Kiwanis Club of the Peninsula at Oyster Point has partnered with Palmer and their English Second Language program. Kiwanis is a community-minded club with a special focus on helping children both locally and internationally. What better way to achieve these goals than assisting students in Palmer's Newcomer Center who have migrated here from across the globe? After meeting with English second language educators, the local Kiwanis Club invited Principal Dr. Melody Cam to one of their weekly meetings at Angelo Steak and Pancake House. Kiwanis Club members were thrilled to offer a check of $1,600 to buy necessary winter clothes for the students and purchase additional classroom resources, including painting supplies and tools for learning to tell time. The donation also provides access to digital learning tools at school and at home for families to have the option to build English proficiency. In addition, the funding supports virtual field trips and guest presentations at Palmer. Educators from Children's Museum of Virginia in Portsmouth visited the newcomers class to offer interactive and hands-on lessons with magnets and motion. The gift from Kiwanis Club also empowers teachers to focus on individual student needs, like buying an alarm clock for a family after their children miss the bus to school. And with spring quickly approaching, the Kiwanis Club of the Peninsula at Oyster Point is excited to expand their partnership with Palmer to possibly include vegetable gardening and planting butterfly-friendly plants to help these newcomers explore nature in a new world. Welcome back. We hope you enjoy this month's school board spotlight. We are still a buzz over our state championship, state champions that were here with us this evening. Also want to acknowledge former school board member Carlton Ashby, who was here, stopped him in the hallway. Um, 
as we know, it, it always takes a village, it takes a lot of adults that support a team. And he was has uh, one of the young ladies that was on the uh, basketball team as one of his mentees. So as we know, it's uh, not by accident. So we had one of our great uh, past school board members is working uh, with that basketball team as well. Well, and now it's time for item two on our agenda. During our regular meetings, we provide time for the public to address the school board. These opportunities are scheduled in the early part of our agenda and also towards the end of the meeting. As advertised, citizens may submit comments via a web form, email, or voicemail up to 30 minutes prior to our meeting to be included in the official meeting record. For those of you joining us in person, the board considers this an opportunity to listen to your comments. Please understand that we are here to listen and we will consider your concerns and respond to you at a later date. We ask that you comply with our three minute time limit. And as you begin your comments, a green light will come on, a yellow light signals that you have 30 seconds remaining, and a red light beep indicates that your time is up. And as your name is called, you may uh, please come forward. At this time, Madam Clerk, I do not have any cards. No, I do okay. not have any cards. Mm -hmm. Are there any other cards? All right. And uh, so we do have uh, Mr. Ashby did want to just acknowledge you briefly. If you wanted to come up and just say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> so we just got through. Uh, you just missed it. We just uh, acknowledged you, announced you. But, uh, well, the, thank you. <laughs> Good evening to everybody, um, to um, Superintendent Dr. Parker, Chairman Mr. Brown, and to the school board. Um, I came this evening to recognize one of my team leaders plays for Mensch for High School. Um, but I think my comments would be very brief. And I would just simply say and share that um, there's a concept that says we're, we are investing in our greatest resource. Our greatest resource are our children. Dr. Barber calls each of you what's called educators. And all that just simply means that you care about children and everything in which you do, you say, you do, your actions display and demonstrate the betterment, the development of children. So as a former school board member, um, I know that you are committed to making a difference and imprint and impact in the lives of children. So may God bless you for the work in which you're doing and continue to invest in the children of Newport News Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashby. All right. Being that I have, we have no additional cards, we will now move on to item three, which is our consent agenda. Item three includes 3.01, minutes from the work session on February 15, 2022. 3.02, minutes from the regular session meeting on February 15, 2022. 3.03, minutes from the school board retreat on February 15, 2022. 3.04, financial reports including the revenue report for February 2022, the expense report for February 2022, child nutrition reports for February 2022. 3.05, the personnel report. 3.06, budget transfer. 3.07, 2022 VSBA Business Honor Roll, 3.08, appointment of the of agent of the school board, 3.09, Virginia Department of Education authorization of signature in the absence of the division superintendent, and 3.10, uh, 3 easement request for Dominion Electric for Minchfield High School. At this time, I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Any discussion? There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Hunter? Four. Mrs. Searles Law? Four. Mrs. Amon? Four. Dr. Best? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. Mr. Harris? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Motion carries 7 0. All right, then now we are on to our action items, which is uh, 4.01, our proposed uh, FY23 operating budget, and I understand, Dr. Parker, you have a short summary to provide us. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, pull the presentation up here. Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Vice Chair, this evening uh, I bring to you the uh, proposed FY23 budget for board consideration. Um, this has been an extensive process for us, uh, which began in the fall of uh, this current school year with uh, development of with budget development. Uh, we uh, also have incorporated the governor's uh, proposed budget, which was released in December 2018. As of today, uh, the state has not, uh, the General Assembly has not passed a, a, f a final budget. Uh, they will continue to deliberate on that budget, and we do not currently have a time frame for that budget to um, to make it to the governor's desk. Uh, therefore, this budget that we are propo proposing to the school board for consideration this evening incorporates the $19.8 million that was um, included in the budget, um, the budget from, uh, that was released on December of 2021. 20, uh, uh, next slide. 
We've held several rounds of um, interest meetings on the budget, and we also have engaged the board in discussions regarding the budget. Uh, this, this, uh, the revenue projection for this budget is um, listed on the screen right there. We're anticipating $19.8 million from the state uh, based on the governor's proposed budget. Um, city revenue in the area of uh, additional $2.8 million. Uh, and uh, that total budget would be $359.4 in revenue, provided we see the uh, General Assembly pass a, a budget with, uh, at, at a minimum $19.8 million. This budget will also incorporate several objectives. Um, we uh, balanced this budget through turnover and attrition. We also looked at uh, the increasing cost of health care and, uh, and also splitting that cost with our employees. Um, and we've also looked at trimming our, but our, our budgets in several departments to allow us to balance our budget uh, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the expenditures totaling $22.6 million, which also matches our revenue. So these are just some detail on the budget and um, with that, with the government funds, the general fund and workers' compensation, um, just some other items that we would have there uh, with the budget. So I'm going to stop there uh, because we've talked about the raises incorporated and what we plan to accomplish in the budget. Uh, my staff is here to answer any questions regarding uh, those increases. And at this time, we are asking that the school board consider adopting uh, that budget, uh, 359.4. Uh, dollars. If you can go back to one slide, Ms. Price. I want to go back to the actual uh, budget. Go back one more. There you go. $359.4 million. Uh, and we also are asking for consideration for a one-time bonus using FY22 funds uh, this evening. That would be $1,000 for full-time employees and um, $500 for part-time em eligible employees as well. Um, obviously, two separate requests, uh, Mr. Chairman. So that will conclude my remarks, and we'll be happy to answer any questions if the board has any regarding that proposed budget. All right. So at this time, before we uh, take questions, of course, let's uh, uh, entertain. Is there a motion to approve the superintendent's recommended budget of $359.4 million, including the one-time bonus to full-time and part-time staff? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion to approve the superintendent's um, FY23 proposed operating budget. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a first? Is there a second? Second. Uh, second by uh, Mr. Ely. All right, uh, now time for, for questions. Any, any questions? All right. All right, are there any, any comments at this time? I just have a comment. Yes, Ms. Yes. Um, I want to give hats off to the team for ve a very robust budget season. Um, Dr. Parker, your team, your leadership with your team has really meant a lot to see how we take the money seriously to do what we need to do in the district. I thank you for um, uh, relating it to our strategic plan so that we as board members can really speak to where the money is going and how it relates to what we're trying to do in the district. And so the enthusiasm with which you all approached this year and you have some new, new roles on your team as this budget season came through, uh, so hats off. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? All right, I'll just uh, make a, a personal comment here. I've, I've uh, said this before, but I don't think it goes without saying I'm personally very uh, proud of this budget, excited about the positions that are being added, uh, excited about where this uh, takes us competitively with our salaries, where we're getting our salaries and how we've dealt with compression, uh, valuing the employees that have been with us for, um, for a duration for long periods of time, making sure that those employees feel respected and rewarded. And, uh, and as well, very you know excited about the middle school sports that I've mentioned that several times, but I don't think it goes without saying tonight that I'm really excited and, and proud of that as well. So I'm excited to uh, get ready to vote for this. All right, so with that, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Um, just one clarifying question. So this um, is to approve the superintendent's FY23 proposed operating budget to include the one-time bonus. Correct. Yes. Okay. Mr. Hunter? Four. Mrs. Searles Law? Four. Mrs. Amon? Four. Dr. Best? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. Mr. Harris? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Motion carries 7 0. All right. All right. Nice work. Awesome. We know that we're, our work is not completely done because the General Assembly is going to 
uh, do some more wrangling, and we're going to have to um, do some more wrangling on our budget. But it, in a year that was a, it's been a very challenging year, it's good to good for us to be able to pass a budget. <laughs> so now let's move on to uh, Section Five: Reports and Information. 5.01 is our monthly school update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this evening we will keep in uh, in line with tradition and keep our monthly school update short. Uh, but we do want to acknowledge that we are making progress as a community with our uh, health metrics and related to the uh, COVID pandemic. And then we also, um, in this evening's report, wanted to give an update on our work with the VDOE and, and school improvement. It's a good evening that, to at least acknowledge some of the hard work that our staff have been doing in collaboration with the Virginia Department of Education. Um, but also, since we have an assessment update uh, later in the, later in the um, agenda, I believe it would set a, a good, um, it, it sets a good precedent for that presentation. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to our staff and uh, get started. I think, I believe Mrs. Car Ms. Carlson will kick us off with the uh, health update. Okay, Nancy, are you with us? I am, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I would like to start this evening with a review of our COVID metrics. Newport News, like most of the state, is in the low range level of community transmission. We are continuing to monitor COVID-19 community transmission. These metrics are updated weekly on our COVID dashboard based on data from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The CDC looks at the combination of three metrics, new COVID-19 admissions per 100,000 population in the past seven days, the percent of staffed inpatient beds occupied by COVID-19 patients and the total new COVID-19 cases per 100,000 population in the past seven days to determine the COVID-19 community level. We are continuing to notice a decrease in the number of positive cases reported within Newport News Public Schools. For the week of March 7th, there were six positive student cases and one positive employee case. In comparison, when we returned to school and work the week of January 3rd, we, re we reported 466 positive cases and 100 of, of student cases, pardon me, and 186 positive employee cases. Next slide, please. Uh, Bionex Now at home COVID, COVID test kits are available at all schools and here at the administration building. Kits are available for students and staff with symptoms of COVID-19 are for those who've been exposed to a person who has tested positive for COVID-19. The test is guided virtually by a medical professional and results are available in 15 minutes. That concludes my presentation for the evening School leadership will present the next slide. Good evening, School Board Chairman Brown, Vice Chairman Searles Law. Dr. Parker and members of the school board. I'm Eleanor Blow, Director of Secondary School Leadership here with the school leadership team. Um, and our team will be here this evening to talk about information and efforts that we are helping doing to help our schools to journey 2025. Our presentation this evening will cover our collaborative efforts with our department along with the Department of Teaching and Learning, along with the Department of Education Office of School Quality. As we school leadership support our schools and school leaders on their journey to accreditation, I will speak briefly on our school support team process. Having recently, recently left the principalship, I am very aware of this SST process and the benefits to our schools and school leaders. The purpose of the school support team meeting is to provide strategic and safe process for our schools to present their data, specific action steps, and to receive feedback from our team. During the process, 
areas of support may be identified and supports may be put in place to assist our schools. In the cycle of continuous school improvement, we also consider the alignment of the written, taught, and assessed curriculum. And it is reviewed through the process of reviewing classroom observations, feedback to teachers, and providing feedback to our administrators. So who is a part of our SST process? Would be the building principals, the assistant principals, lead teachers, directors, content supervisors and specialists, students with the students with disabilities department, youth development, data analysis, student services as well. The focus of our SST meetings would be differentiated supports and leadership experiences to provide tiered levels of support to our schools. In the meetings, data is reviewed and it is presented to the leaders present in the meeting. The school improvement plan and action steps are also reviewed. And as a result of the review, modifications are made to the school's improvement plan if necessary. These, these SST meetings take place at least three to four times per school year. In addition to the school support team meetings, principals receive individualized and ongoing feedback from the school leadership team on their school improvement plans and their student achievement efforts. Next, Dr. Bird, Executive Director of Ele Elementary School Leadership, will provide more information regarding the monitoring process for continuous improvement. Thank you, Dr. Blow. All right, my part will be brief. Um, what Dr. Blow has explained in the previous slide was simply our continuous school improvement process. Uh, this is a, a process that we go through each year as we work to assist with our schools. Uh, within the elements of that slide, she talked about these um, five phases, identifying the uh, priority area focus, we develop SMART goals, we determine and develop essential actions, and then we develop um, detailed essential actions. And that's a process that takes place each year. And we review and modify these action steps and goals as the year goes on. Um, phase five here, connect to implementation and monitoring. So we've taken this process that we go through each year, we've taken it up a level. And um, we've done this in partnership and collaboration with the Virginia Department of Education Office of School Quality. And Dr. Herman is going to come up to the podium next and tell a little bit about this collaborative act effort. Thank you. All right, good evening. I have the exciting part of the presentation. I'm teasing. We are excited to share with you a pilot partnership that several of our elementary and middle schools have joined with the Virginia Department of Education. Newport News Public Schools has voluntarily partnered with the Virginia Department of Education Office of School Quality to support school improvement in our identified priority schools. Here's a brief overview of our partnership. What is OSQ? OSQ stands for Office of School Quality. It is an arm of the Virginia Department of Education whose purpose is to assist schools in the continuous school improvement process. Why will we be a part of this pilot? We are committed to formalize a process for continuous growth and improvement to be used with our schools throughout Newport News and, and as a pilot for the state. Who is a part of this program? With the support of school leadership in teaching and learning, we have had several elementary schools to include Sedgefield Elementary, Newsom Park Elementary, Carver Elementary, Sanford Elementary, Crittenden Middle School, and Passage Middle School volunteer to be a part of this pilot. We have gained as a division a coach from the Office of, the school, uh, Office of school Quality Department, as well as a school quality consultant coordinator. What we have found along this journey is that many of our school leaders have voluntarily participated as it has become an authentic learning process for professional development and an opportunity for them as leaders to continuously learn. Now Dr. Barnett will share how we've seamlessly incorporated this process into our school support team process. Good evening. As we continue to support school improvement, our partnership with the Virginia Department Office of School Quality has afforded us several unique opportunities. First, we've been able to pilot 
the Office of School Quality's new academic review audit tool. Two of our schools volunteer to participate in piloting this tool to review lesson planning and classroom observations. Additionally, an opportunity for professional development for our principals was provided through a collaborative effort in conducting instructional rounds. Both elementary and secondary principals were invited to join our partners from the Office of School Quality to conduct learning walks in schools and gain knowledge around specific classroom look-fors and best practices in instruction. It also allowed our school leaders to calibrate their observation feedback with our Virginia Department of Education partners. Finally, the partnership between Newport News Public Schools and the Office of School Quality has provided a division coach who regularly collaborates with our school leadership and teaching and learning departments. Our division coach serves as a thought partner promoting the alignment of the written, taught, and tested curriculum. Our coach has joined us on learning walks, the OSQ progress monitoring meetings, school support team meetings, and division senior leadership work sessions. We are excited about this partnership and we look forward to our continued collaboration in this school improvement journey. At this time, we'll entertain any questions on our school improvement journey and partnership, if there are any. Any questions at this time? Yes, Dr. Bess? How long is this process? Like, this is our first year, correct? Well, we've been working with our Office of School Quality. We uh, participated in what they call academic reviews. We've done that in years mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. But this year, we have some additional unique opportunities to collaborate with them and with our coach in doing our learning walks, our instructional rounds, as well as helping to pilot a new tool that they want to use. So it's pretty much we're helping them and they're helping us as well with feedback. But do they anticipate it to be like a two-year project or is it just one year for the feedback and then possibly to develop a program? Well, we'll continue throughout the end of this year, and they are assisting us in some of our identified schools and needs of, of school improvement. So we'll continue this process with them as we continue to support our schools in improvement. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Madam Vice Chair? I'm just curious about other divisions that have partnered. Um, with this effort, what kind of gains or resources have they gotten? I'm going to think we're at first. Yes, first. Right. We are. So well, the that's... tool that we use in our collaborative walkthroughs and instructional rounds, this is new. Well, that's just totally We're on great. the cutting edge, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so what, what's different with this is what they used to do if a school was an improvement, they would ask us to pull together some evidence they would come and schedule a meeting and they would just review our evidence mm -hmm. and have now they're actually they actually provided professional development in this room yes, <laughs> to principals they they're doing learning walks with them they're actually sitting in on school support team meetings they're really more and they've assigned a person to actually be a, be the coach so they're getting out of the office at the VDOE and coming and actually getting seeing the actual work that's taking place and coaching us on improving our schools which is a very different process than what was in place in the past years. We just had to ship pull evidence and we had to show them evidence mm -hmm. of lesson plan checks, learning walks, but now they're actually in there with you. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's been a, it's been interesting and we are, we are um, I think we volunteered for this. We, we weren't voluntold. Yes, we, 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 we volunteered, we were not voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> there is a difference. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any questions? And the final thing is athletics. Uh, we just want to give you a quick update. The spring sports are underway. Mr. Nichols will just provide a brief update on athletics. Chairman Brown, Vice Chair of Service Law, School Board, Dr. Parker, um, good evening. My name is Mike Nichols, the Program Administrator for um, Youth Development. And I'm here this evening just to give you a very brief update on um, spring sports. Um, but before I get into spring sports, I too would like to just also say congratulations to the Lady Canes um, indoor track team and also to the Lady Monarchs for their outstanding championship year. And hopefully that success will carry over to their spring sports as well. Mm -hmm. But as you can see um, displayed before you uh, is the spring sports update. Spring sports began back on February the 21st 
with our um, out spring sports, baseball, outdoor track, soccer, softball, and tennis. And their competition season will be, um, began also on March 15th. And their competition season will conclude will continue until um, the June time frame when they will have their state competitions. Also, the middle school basketball season started yesterday on March 21st, and their first play date will be April the 11th, and their season will conclude on May the 11th when they have their tournament championship. So that's just a little update on spring sports, and do you guys have any questions? Any questions? All right. I just have uh, one question in terms of we've now we've been working through these compressed type of schedules and shifting schedules because of the COVID pandemic. Are we through that and we now have a regular full 10 game season for most sports or are we still in a compressed? It's a regular full schedule all year. We have had a full schedule for all sports. Okay. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, so Mr. Chairman, I, I would uh, ask that, uh, that we be able to call uh, Ms. Scar Mr. Scarlett Mento up to the podium. Apparently, uh, there are additional portions of our budget that need to be approved. That's correct. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. So we are, the okay. board has approved the general fund of $359.4 million, but there are other funds that uh, also, through this process, uh, need to be approved for, uh, for access to those funds for next year. So this slide... I said the that we that I've moved away from but yeah. obviously needed to speak okay. to. Yeah, so I'll leave it over to you, Scarlett, and you can explain that to the board and uh, and it would just take another motion, Mr. Mr. Chairman, to approve these Oops, other fund funding good. sources. Okay, so the total school board adopted funds are three hundred and three hundred and eighty three million six hundred and eighty thousand one hundred and forty six. And you have already approved the three hundred fifty nine, three seventy three, two ten, but we also need you to approve workers comp at Two million three hundred and twenty-eight thousand four hundred and eighty-six. Our textbook fund of three point five million, and our child nutrition services of eighteen million four hundred seventy-eight thousand four hundred fifty for a total of three hundred eighty-three thousand million. Excuse me, six hundred eighty thousand one hundred forty-six. Okay. okay. All right. So then, at this time, I'll ask for a motion to approve the superintendent's proposed workers' compensation uh, textbook fund and child nutrition services. Mm -hmm recommendation and we can do that as a block right yeah we'll, so we'll do it as one yeah one okay. block so uh, mr. chairman I do make a motion that we approve the workers compensation textbook fund a child nutrition services um, uh, budget amounts as presented is there a second second All right. second by uh, mr. hunter all right any discussion there being none, then, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Hunter? Four. Mrs. Searles Law? Four. Mrs. Amen? Four. Dr. Best? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. Mr. Harris? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Motion carries 7 0. Okay, all right. And Thank now you, Mr. We Chairman. I don't want to get caught on the technicality. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, all right, 5.2. We have our mid year assessment update, and uh, we have our assessment team. and. I just want to say, as uh, Dr. Meg Lamont and Mr. Nieves uh, present this data, it has been uh, quite a bit of work. I want to appreciate their efforts, uh, and I hope you appreciate it as well. Um, and I hope you uh, this, this report will be well received. We have uh, gone through our mid-year assessments for both growth and, and uh, benchmarks in certain areas, and they are here to provide the board with an update on how our data with our students are trending, uh, but also what's coming up as we move, as we prepare for spring testing. So. Dr. Mangalot, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Dr. Parker. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Vice Chair Searles Law, members of our board, Dr. Parker. Um, tonight is the night many of us have awaited. So we are excited to bring to you our collection of student data from our mid-year assessments. I have with me tonight our new supervisor of strategic planning and data analytics, Mr. Marcus Nieves. He is truly the data guru behind this. I am the talking head. He has put all of this together. He has disaggregated the data. And I would be remiss not to mention his data team, Lisa Kuhn and Danielle Ross, all three of whom are very instrumental in making this presentation happen tonight. So be before we begin tonight, um, I just want to preface that this is a global view. We'd be here all night if I was going to dig really deeply into this data. We are presenting you a snapshot of where we currently are and what our plans are moving forward based upon the data that I present to you. 
In an effort for full transparency though, all of you have access to our data through our data dashboard. Last year we used something called Power BI. This year we're using something Tableau. It's not that different. It looks a little different, but it has the same functionality. With that, you will be able to filter down your data by your school level, by school, by grade, by class, student demographics, um, and our special populations. Um, you will see exactly what everybody in the division sees, principals, teachers, etc. Mr. Neves is passing out a one-pager. Um, he'll give it to Ms. Buffalo. Um, that will guide you through the access of this dashboard. It gives you the, the web link. It gives you the username and login, which is temporary. You can reset it at that time. Um, and if you have any questions accessing our data dashboard, please feel free to reach out to me, Mr. Neves, or his team, and we'll gladly assist you. Tonight, I will be presenting um, elementary reading, secondary reading, elementary mathematics, secondary mathematics, and biology data, all in that order. So let's go ahead and just dive right in. We're going to begin with elementary. The Newport News Elementary Literacy Program, it aligns directly with our strategic plan, Journey 2025, and our K-12 literacy plan. It is grounded in the science of reading and it is data informed. There are two major diagnostic tools that we use to help guide our teaching and learning with our teachers in building principles as we create, implement, and adjust student learning through ongoing data collection and analysis. These two tools are the PALS assessment and reading inventory. Reading Inventory is a research-based adaptive student assessment program and it measures reading skills and longitudinal student progress. And we use it in Newport News in our grades three through eight. PALS, as you know, is VDOE supported, it's UVA created, and we use it throughout the state of Virginia. I also want to pre um, preface one important thing. Um, the VDOE establishes accreditation this year not only on the performance of our students on the content standards and their proficiency, it's also measuring growth. So in Newport News, we carefully are monitoring both proficiency and growth. So tonight's presentation, we will focus on both of those. Student growth or student proficiency is when a learner has demonstrated competence in relation to the knowledge and skills of the content standards passed by our states. The target does not move throughout the year. If you are going to pass math, you need a 400, regardless of whether you're in fall, you're in mid-year, or you're in June. Growth is a little bit different. It's a learning progress made by students through instructional experiences. The target adjusts throughout the year, and it's based on several factors, grade level, growth goals, and the amount of expected growth in a year. In short, as the year progresses, the level to achieve benchmark goes up. As I present this data to you, I think it's really important to understand that construct. As you look at the screen right here, we see PALS. In fall, so PALS is an overall score. You get identified based on your overall score. But there's also categories, and those categories help drive instruction. So if you just look at the top row, you'll see that in fall, I have to meet a benchmark of five. But by mid-year, that benchmark goes up to either 9 or 10. So I have to score a 9 or 10 mid-year in order to meet benchmark. So it's a moving target. If you look at RI, the same thing is held true. You can see that I have a grade, and your Lexile score, or your proficiency as reading, is measured by your grade level. You will take a pre-test, then you will take a post-test. Based on that information, the algorithm depicts your expected growth, and that expected growth is personalized for everybody based upon your initial score. Then, you actually will be assigned your actual growth, what you have to grow in order to meet benchmark on your next test. Lastly, it will tell you the growth needed based on points. So as you can see, that target is always moving. So let's go back to PALS. So PALS is an early intervention um, reading initiative established in 1997, and we've been given it in Virginia since 2000. 
These assessments measure children's knowledge of important literacy fundamentals such as phonological awareness, alphabet awareness, letter sound knowledge, spelling, concept of word, word recognition, um, and oral passage reading. Trend data supports across the state, not just in Newport News, the adverse effects of COVID-19. Students in the early years of learning reading through a virtual modality did not adapt as readily as when they are in person. As you can see in fall of 2018, our 71% of our students met the benchmark for PALS. Now look at fall of, 2020, of 2021 and 51% of our students met benchmark. So you can see the direct impact on the pandemic. Again, I will say this is not Newport News specific. It's not even Virginia specific. This is a national trend that we've identified based on COVID-19. So the, the following data right here shows only the progress of students who were PALS kindergarten identified. So these are, this is the PALS kindergarten test. And the data you see are only those that did not meet the benchmark. So that's important to understand. Um, so as a student, as you see, like at the top, 54% of our, of all PALS ID students did not meet the benchmark for category titled group and individual rhyme. Of that 54%, only 25% the mid-year did not meet the benchmark for that category. What this tells us is that by mid-year, 75% of all of our identified PALS kindergarten students showed progress in that one particular category on the PALS assessment. Also demonstrating here, the target moved. Not only did we show growth, but we showed growth with the target increasing as well. As another example, 19% of the PALS ID students did not meet the benchmark for category titled spelling. Of that 19%, only 6% did not meet the benchmark for that particular category. This shows that 94% of our students identified as PALS ID for the kindergarten assessment met the benchmark of at least 10 for the spelling category. In the fall, we had 658 identified PALS students in grades one through three. Like kindergarten PALS assessment, these students are identified by an overall score, but their performance for each category can be different. So I could not have meant the benchmark for the entire assessment, but I may be rocking it in one of the categories. So it just depends on your overall score. As you can see, 15% of all students that were PALS ID'd in fall met the benchmark for fall word recognition. In the spring, 56 of those PALS ID'd who were tested again in first, second, and third grade met the same benchmark. Even with mid-year fall word recognition benchmark increasing, all of our students in grades one through three showed a gain of 41% in that one particular category. While not all of our categories show the same gain, we know where we need to focus our efforts with specific targeted student groups, and that's the beauty of the diagnostic test. Overall, we are very pleased with our PALS data because it's trending positively. While we still have much to do, it is nice to be able to celebrate these gains with teachers, parents, and students. Since 2018, we knew in Newport News that we needed some way to diagnose where students were in reading beyond the PALS assessment after third grade. In 2018, we adopted the reading inventory. The reading inventory supports fluency, comprehension, and vocabulary development. This diagnostic test is used in all elementary and middle school buildings in Newport News grades three through eight. 
The next few slides, we will focus on both proficiency and growth for all students in these elementary grades. Let's go over proficiency first. As you can see, our students are becoming more proficient readers over time in their reading ability. We are seeing our below basic and our basic percentages drop and our proficiency in our advanced bands go up. This shows an increase in our overall performance, and this is exactly what you want to see with data. The basic and the below basic go down, and our proficient and advanced go up. Mm. While it shows we have moved 3.6% of students to a proficient band, it is noteworthy to mention there may be students in the basic band who went from that very low level up to the very high level of basic. They don't necessarily jump to the proficient band, but they're still moving. And that isn't represented in the data on an overall view. You see it when you drill down to student class um, data. Here is another look at our proficiency, but by grade level. You can see how our students at each grade level have moved from below basic to basic. 7% of our third graders move from below basic to basic with numbers moving up in the proficient and advanced bands. Fourth and fifth grade show similar trends for basic and below basic bands are decreasing and proficient and advanced are increasing. This slide switches to the growth for our students versus their proficiency. As you can see, all students are trending in the same direction for growth. Be mindful that this growth data can be a little bit tricky. Students who are identified at meeting grade level standards or above in fall may not show growth by band because they are already proficient. Okay, so I tested and I have a Lexile range of 520 to 824 because I'm in third grade. I scored a 530 in the fall. I'm proficient. By mid-year, now I have a score of 800 in the spring. I'm still proficient, I'm not below grade level, but I don't necessarily show growth because I haven't moved bands. So that's um, something that's missing from the overall data as well. As we analyze our data, we are looking at overall district, overall school, overall classroom, but we're getting really down deep into every student's lexile and growth goals to determine instructional plans. It tells a story for every single student. We are also communicating with students themselves so they can goal set and take ownership of their learning. And we're also communicating regularly with our parents regarding their child's reading progress. So every time we assess, our parents get a letter and they're notified. And then if they are below, we, they, they go to student support and parents are communicated with that way. Here's another look at growth by schools. This data represents our elementary schools that tested 80% or more of their student populations during a testing window. There were special circumstances where four of our schools had to test outside of that window, so their data isn't presented here in this particular image. These were Jenkins, Katherine Johnson, Discovery STEM, and Greenwood. Their data is still available on the data dashboard for you to see, and it's available in Synergy Analytics as well for our principals and our teachers. I have taken the liberty of highlighting our Title I schools, and you can see they are showing significant progress. This is exciting because as we begin to dig a little bit further into the data, we begin to really see individual student gains. In buildings, we celebrate all gains with students and we motivate and encourage them to move forward. We also far, um, focus on targeted areas for growth and proficiency for each individual student, and we develop intervention and remediation strategies that meet the needs of all individuals' weaknesses. As I analyzed our Title I schools, I noticed some significant gains at Sedgefield and McIntosh Elementary. Sedgefield showed significant gains of 32%, and McIntosh showed significant gains of 29%. We all know the challenges that we face at Title I schools. They have dis distinct characteristics. We wanted to learn from them, we wanted to replicate, and we want to scale their success. So I asked our principals three main questions. What do you feel has helped your school make significant gains? What has been your instructional strategy through the mid-year? And how has the mid-year data informed your plans moving forward? 
Jackie Barber, our principal for the Sedgefield Eagles, has said, our commitment to letters school-wide has been a factor in our gains this year. Explicit, systemic, small group instruction is the key. Monthly testing where students receive immediate feedback, goals are set, and progress is celebrated. Our approach is special, it's intentional, and it makes all the difference. Ethel Francis, our principal at the McIntosh Scotty, says, as a K-5 letter school, our teachers embrace and implement strategies shared during division and school-based PD. We focus on developing teachers' instructional planning to implement direct and explicit phonemic awareness and comprehension strategies for all students via, via the Tier 1 instruction. McIntosh engages as a whole team, leadership teams, reading specialists, teachers, where feedback is framed around coaching support and developing teacher efficacy. Now we're going to move into our secondary reading data. We are utilizing the reading in inventory for grades six through eight, but we're also utilizing benchmark data um, for all grades in the areas of reading and writing six through 11. I'm gonna first go through the reading inventory data and then I'll present the benchmark data for you. So I want to provide a little context. Newport News started giving students that reading inventory in 2018. Based off the data, we, our curriculum and development team work with building principles to develop specific classes that target reading deficits for identified students. If you are behind grade level and you sit in a grade level class at the middle school, you're not going to make gains because you're not focused on intentional fluency and comprehension you need to be in a specialized class. So they worked out classes for Read 180 and System 44, where our Tier 2 students and Tier 3 students work with systems and direct instruction through a blended learning model to have gains in their overall literacy foundations. Both systems are research-based. Read 180 is designed for struggling readers who are at least two or more years behind grade level whereas System 44 is really designed specifically with students who are really struggling and have learning challenges. It places that student at the level, it's gonna meet them where they are, and it's gonna help them build those foundations. These tiered supports allow our students to still access grade level English with their peers, but it also utilizes that additional block of time in a very strategic, personalized manner. Currently in Newport News, it depends on the school, we have about between 75 and 100 students per grade level identified for either a Read 180 or a System 44 class. So this data is not representative of all students at our middle school. These are targeted students. In Newport News, we allowed our middle school principals to decide whether they wanted to test all their students whether they wanted to um, test identified students in all English classes, or whether or not they wanted to just test those students in Read 180 classes or System 44 classes. So that's why the total students tested were 2,617. We do not have 2,600 students in Read 180 classes or System 44. However, what we did is we compared apples to apples. We took the data from fall and only those students that we had fall data did we compare mid-year data. So this is true comparison apple to apple. Um, when you do, you can see that we're trending very similar to our elementary data with our basic and below basic decreasing and our proficient and advanced bands are increasing. When we look at our school comparison, we can also so schools are showing the significant gains. But you need to also pay attention to the number of students tested as well. So you can see that Heinz, Gildersleeve, and Passage tested the, all of their student population. But they're also showing significant gains. Other schools tested smaller numbers because they were only targeting specific students. They were really using that di um, data to really help them hone in inward remediation and intervention. Um, so here is another look at growth. You can see we are showing gains in reading based upon the numbers. Now this is not all of our students, right? So 42% of our sixth graders were tested in mid-year. Of that 42%, 37.6% showed growth. 
44% of seventh graders were tested. And of the 44%, 39.3 showed growth. And then lastly, 44% of our eighth graders were tested and of them, 37.9 demonstrated some form of growth. As in typical years, Newport News created mid-year assessments and were given to determine student mastery of the taught um, content standards. This year, we've given all secondary math, reading, writing, science, and social studies division assessments. At the elementary level, we only gave division assessments in science, social studies, and writing. Considering the amount of testing we're doing with diagnostic testings, we didn't want to over-test our students and we focused on growth due to unfinished learning. Also because the diagnostic assessments can really provide great data for how and it informs instruction. For quarter three, we will test all grade levels and content areas for content standard mastery and that will help us refine our strategies to provide our stu students opportunities to readdress those content standards yet not mastered. Here you will see data for secondary reading and writing. As you can see, our students are working towards proficiency on content standards. We are utilizing this data during school-based PLC time to guide plans for additional supports, readjustment of pacing, resource provisioning, and additional instructional time. We dive down deeper into our benchmark data by looking at it by strand and item descriptor. Our assessments that we create are aligned to our SOLs. Because of that, we're able to break it down. They're broken down. The strands are identified as red, yellow, and green. That makes for analysis to be a little bit easier for our teachers and building leaders. All of the SDBQ dashboards can drill down by school, class, and student to address those specific needs at various levels. The data is driving discussions during instructional leadership meetings teacher professional learning communities, department and grade level planning, and teacher lesson development. Through careful analysis of the data, we are able to track each student's individual successes and areas of focus. Targeted in interventions and remediations are in place and strategic placement are interwoven throughout the school day, after school, and along with Saturday schools. Leaders and teachers are not alone in the journey to ensure our students reach mastery of content standards. Schools are using what we call proficiency trackers like the one on the slide, and they use them with their students to personalize the instruction. Through the tracking of stand, strand mastery identified by the SDBQ and Synergy dashboards, students are encouraged to take ownership of what they are learning and what they need to learn through goal setting. Classroom teachers, interventionists, reading specialists, administrators, and other support staff facilitated this process throughout the year. Now on to math. The Newport News Mathematics Program builds upon the Virginia Mathematical Standards, but also supports five goals for students. We want our students to become mathematical problem solvers. They, we want them to communicate mathematically reason mathematically, make mathematical connections, and use mathematical rep representations to model and interpret practical solutions. In 2018, the Newport News School Board adopted Eureka Mathematics as the instructional model for elementary mathematics. Eureka is a nationally ranked curriculum built around the core principle that students need to know more than the right answer when they're solving a problem. The curriculum helps our students make those mathematical connections, use representations and models to understand the why behind problem solving, and then it helps them to communicate and make meaning of math. This aligns directly with our goals established by, by the VDOE and the philosophy of our mathematics program. To support curriculum and instructional decisions, we are now using mathematics inventory to measure what mathematical principles our students are ready to learn through the use of a quantile score. We can measure students' growth in their mathematical thinking and foundations to help guide instructional practices and supports to personalize instruction for all students. The math inventory is given to all students in grades two through five. The following slides identify student proficiencies in mathematical foundations. Based upon our data from spring of 2021, 
and across the state, we identified how difficult it was to teach math virtually. We were not surprised when our fall data showed that 63.7% of our students in grades two through five were below basic. We were committed to going into the school year with a strong model for mathematics and to include the continuation of the Eureka implementation, Eureka coaching in every single elementary school throughout the year, unit diagnostic tools through Eureka Equip that identifies learning gaps and addresses them through direct instruction and fluency practice. Our teachers meet weekly in PLCs to discuss data from the math inventory and Eureka Equip to provide our students with instruction that is tiered for their own personalized level of learning. As you can see, our efforts are paying off. We showed significant decrease in the numbers of students who measured below basic in fall to below basic in spring. We dropped 12.8 percentage points. We see huge shifts in the number of students who measure both proficient and advanced proficient. Like reading, this is the normal trend for improvement. Basic and below basic bands should decrease and proficient and advanced should increase. If we dig a bit more, we can see these trends at each grade level. While coaching, professional learning, and the implementation of Eureka with Fidelity is still in its infancy, we continue to show gains. Please take a moment to look over the grade level data. When the board adopted Eureka Math in the spring of 2018, year one implementation occurred with six schools, Newsom Park, Carver, Sedgefield, Hydenwood, Stony Run, and Saunders. And that year ended in the pandemic. So students went home in March and teachers had to learn to teach virtually. Year two implementation of Eureka Math happened completely virtual when the entire curriculum is designed for whole classroom in-person instruction. Year three is really like year one for this curriculum, since its true implementation is finally face-to-face -face and in-person. And even despite this, you can see significant gains, especially in our Title I schools who face those distinct challenges. Hydenwood and Carver are both Title I schools, and they are showing significant gains. Hydenwood gained 26% in growth and Carver has grown by 24%. We asked our principals those same three questions so we can learn and grow and scale. Brian Lieberman, our principal of Hydenwood Husky says, Hydenwood gains can be attributed to pre-assessments prior to teachers to identify unlearned standard, standards, use of math interventionists to support personalized small group instruction, collaboration with the Eureka Coach, and implementation of Eureka with Fidelity. In our examination of mid-year data, we were able to identify needs and provide necessary wraparound supports for teachers and students. Ms. Diane Willis, principal of our Carver Codes, utilization of the acceleration block provides students with an additional 30 minutes to practice and master skills. Eureka Coaching supports teachers with deeper conversations around their progression of math skills on concepts. We provide a focus recap after every coaching session to include key takeaways and next steps for instruction and alignment. Conversations around data allow us to pinpoint student progression toward growth goals and develop strategic next steps for all students. In the middle school and high school, we continue to give division created assessments in quarter one in mid-year, and we will give another round in quarter three. These assessments are cumulative and they measure the standards taught according to the Newport News curriculum and our pacing. As mentioned earlier, we use this data to inform our instructional decisions. Through detailed strand analysis through the SDBQ data, daily formative assessments, and performance assessments, school teams have a wealth of data that help them develop personalized plans to ensure mastery of the content standards. Data is trending in the right direction. We know that Math 7 historically has been a challenge for students in Newport News and across the state. Breaking down our data and targeting strand deficits, our schools are providing additional supports for mathematics through 45-minute blocks, 
push and support pull-out groups, and blended model using personalized data systems like IXL, MathWorks. And we are confident our students will continue to trend towards mastery. You can also see that I included data for the biology mid-year. Both Algebra 1 and Biology are verified credits and they are needed for all students for graduation. And I would have been remiss not putting both of those up here for your analysis. Um, just prefacing that we also know that all benchmarks that were given, all data is available in the data dashboard and it's available in Synergy Analytics for all buildings and principals. So prior to the end of last school year, the teaching and learning team, we anticipated um, learning loss. And we began to ensure we had research and evidence-based resources, practices, and supports in place before the year began. While this mid-year data informs our work, we realized that we actually had the right structures in place. And the data just helps us shift and, and navigate supports to the areas that need it most. As you can see, our biggest focus was on Tier 1 instruction. This is the primary level of intervention implemented in a general classroom, reaching the largest targeted majority of students. While we target whole classroom, instructional models and practices still support small group personalized instruction through grouping, blended learning, push-in models, and pull-out models. We also use a wide variety of strategies to include professional learning, such as letters, Eureka, PLCs, data analysis, and coaching. We refocus our curriculum through priority standards and collaborative observation feedback loops. Tier two and tier three are much smaller, they're more targeted, and they utilize many systems discussed in today's presentations. We also utilize the student support team model to develop those strategies for students and progress monitor throughout the entire year. While the right structures have been in place throughout the year, we are shifting supports based upon our data. As you can see, many of the supports are similar to what we have been doing all year long, but the strategy involves deeper, deeply diving into our data, identifying areas for improvement, and then placing the right resources and supports where they're needed most. We're shifting school-based and division supports to align with each building's data through PLC work, collaborative learning walks, university instructors as tutors, and push-in and pull-out support, continued coaching, and continued modeling of instruction by our supervisors, our instructional coaches. This work involves conjunction with building leadership to develop strategic plans for targeted students and to support them through tiered systems. We've also internally identified areas for curriculum refinement based on the data to include pacing shifts, alignment, refinement to the written, taught, and assessed, and refinement in how we implement our curriculum in the classroom. As you know, data collection, analysis, and targeted supports do not stop mid-tier. This is an ongoing collaborative process um, where we ourselves are true learners in that process. Um, we humbly accept what the data tells us. And regardless of how passionate we are about a model, about a program, about a system, and we will adjust and always do what is in the best interest of our students in Newport News. We will assess all content standards at the end of quarter three and the beginning of quarter four, grades three and up, to help determine um, student SOL and grade level readiness. That We will continue to use diagnostic data as well. That data will go through the end of April. It will help inform summer learning and will also help inform and help us set up for fall learning. This concludes my very long presentation. How can, what, what questions can I answer for you? All right, <coughs> questions. Dr. Best. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Maglamont. Very detailed, specific. It's just a lot to digest at, at this hour, but I appreciate it. For for the letters training, mm -hmm. now are all teachers, it, it was like a course, am I correct? That yes, continues? it is. So mm -hmm. it was the expectation for them to continue and complete that course, or were they kind of give it a break on we did give them a break so we all teachers who were letters trained this year they were very it's just been a hard year 
And we gave them the opportunity to kind of pause and regroup either in summer or next fall or this upcoming fall. And I think we only had 40 teachers take us up on that. The majority of teachers who were undergoing training this year wanted to, to move forward with the training. And, it, and it's fun going through learning walks and, and looking at classroom observations and seeing our teachers implement the strategies, even though they're not asked to implement yet, but they're, but they're doing that. And it's exciting seeing them. Okay, and two more things. For the middle school, they were given the option to test selected students or all of their students for middle school. And when I glanced at it, it was quick. It, it looked like the schools that um, did all of them seem to be doing a little bit better. It, yes, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was correct. Mm -hmm. And then just, and it might be too early, based on where it looks like things are kind of going now, what are your predictions for summer session? What are you, uh, what are you kind of anticipating? Absolutely, that's a great question. Our instructional team is currently meeting. I don't know, I have um, Miss Lori Wall here and Dr. Joanne Jones. I don't know if they wanna to speak to that yet. We definitely are utilizing our diagnostic data, but we're waiting until fall. So that fourth diagnostic right. term, we will look at that data and it will help drive what students we want to push into summer school. Now you know that our summer school will be um, intense reading mm -hmm. and, and mathematics as well, but we also have enrichment for summer programs as well because we want our students to, um, to receive acceleration mm -hmm. and explore different um, opportunities besides just being in the classroom. It, it seems like it's going to be, based on what you presented, it'll be very intentional, very focused, very not bluff. So Absolutely. You know, Dr. Best, that was our model last summer as well. And you know that we um, encouraged our reading specialists. We had a reading specialist. We had small group instruction. Um, very intense. We had a specific program. This year, unfortunately, we lose a week just based on the calendar. Mm -hmm. um, but our goal is to still hit it hard and to make sure that our students um, have an opportunity, another opportunity to try and catch up. And I'm, I'm just one more thing, because last year it was kind of like like an invitation for summer school. This year, it'd be more, we really need you there to get you here, kind of push. You know, I didn't know it was an invitation. It's, I think that we targeted. That was we kind targeted. of the feel. <laughs> I feel like I we know targeted. We targeted but that was yeah. kind of the feel, like uh -huh. the parents uh -huh. were like, they don't have to, they didn't say they had to go. No, they really need to go if they invited you. Because uh -huh. they were like, it was an invitation. Well, we will make sure that they know that we want them there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, Ms. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, let's see. A very comprehensive report. Thank you for that. Um, I think the question that I really have, uh, we keep hearing the buzz of Brown, the need for reading specialists and reading coaches. Mm -hmm. Can you just uh, talk about just a little bit of how we utilize them? I'm going to gonna call up Miss Lori Wall up here to get where talk. we're going. <laughs> it's driven by data and small group instruction, but she may be able to add a little bit more because she really guides that process. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Um, in the elementary world, our reading specialists, some schools um, have two, but everyone has at least one reading specialist. They divide their time between um, partnering with teachers around instructional practice. So they might be co-teaching with the teacher. They might be modeling a lesson. Um, they might be observing and giving feedback to a coaching cycle that they just finished to see how they met their goal. They could be um, on the other side of the day, they might be intervening with students. And so based on student need that you saw in the data, they may have a group of students that they see for a cycle of instruction. Um, to see if they can make that goal. And then in addition, they're the ones leading our letters training. They were the facilitators of that. So at every building, they are um, side by side with the teachers going through each of those sessions. And there's a bridge to practice piece. So they look at, they follow three students throughout this whole year as they're learning letters and they take a deep dive to say, what am I learning about this and how does that apply to students in my classroom? So they are the ones who are facilitating that conversation and reflection. So they do a, a variety of professional learning, um, co-teaching and modeling, and then they also do instruction with, with students. And they span K-5, so they have to determine where is the need 
um, at the time. So it's flexible and fluid. So they might be supporting in third grade for a period of time, and then they may, may need to go to kindergarten and circle back to, to third grade. And while that teacher is implementing on their own and then circle back to say, okay, let's set a new goal. So it's very fluid um, and flexible, but it's always focused on, on the data. Okay, and are we adequately staffed with those? Can we always use meridian specialists? Of course. Um, they will always say, uh, is, is there a, a need? Um, I think if you look at the numbers right now, the, the state is saying, you know, looking at 550 mm -hmm. students um, per reading specialist, is there always a need for kids to have high quality um, access to, to people who have reading instruction? Absolutely. So I guess I'll always say yes. Um, but do we, ha do we work really strong with what we have and do we outfit our schools that are in a higher need with, mm -hmm. with an extra reading specialist? That's something I think that's special about Newport News. Not everyone has access to the level of reading specialists that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a selling point for us that you're going to have high levels of support if you become a teacher here at Newport News. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ely, um, thank you for your amazing presentation. Quick question. I know we're doing a lot to help the kids who um, had a significant amount of learning loss over the pandemic, but what about the kids like me when I was in high school? I went to summer school every year and didn't need to go to summer school. Are kids allowed to go to summer school to gain that extra knowledge? or if they just, want, they just want to be in summer school to get ahead, will they be able to do that as well? You know, and what drives who can come to summer school is really the need and the number of teachers that we have that sign up, Mr. Ely. So if our need is very high and we have a lot of students that have been invited or mandated, um, <laughs> we will, they may have to take up that seat. But you know Newport News, we have plenty of opportunities for enrichment. We have camps, we have the eager program, we have outdoor education. There are so many ways that a student can advance their learning. We also have Virtual Virginia as well, which is another way for our middle school and high school students to advance their learning. So again, lots of opportunities, but I can't promise that we will have seats for every student who just wants to, to come to summer school. I wish we could. That's good, I'm excited to hear that. So mm -hmm. how we pushing this, I wanna see us push those opportunities mm -hmm. too the enrichment because every child is not behind. There's some kids it's like, I want to learn more, I want to learn more, I want to get ahead. So how we pushing and learning loss, we could push the other way of ways you can get ahead during the summer in Newport News. Yeah. So, but thank you so much, it was an amazing presentation. A lot of numbers, a lot of data. I'm sure Douglas appreciate this 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again for all the hard work you and your team is doing. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Amy. Um, I'm going to go back to Dr. Best's question on who was tested for what, just so I make sure I, I know when I'm looking at the database. Absolutely. So the um, elementary testing, was PALS everyone? PALS is, um, for fall, everyone tests, and that's how they get identified. Right. So if they don't meet the benchmark, they're identified. This year, for mid-year, we really focused on our PALS ID students, and we tested them. Um, and then we even tested by category. So let's say, Ms. Amen, in one category you soared, you know, maybe I didn't test you there, but I tested you on the ones that you did not meet benchmark. So we were intentional on who we tested because there is so much tense testing and we really wanted it to inform what we're doing in the classroom because it's a form of progress monitoring and it helps inform what you're going to do. Now for reading inventory, all students two through five tested, mm -hmm. but at the middle school, it just depended on principal leadership. They may have, might have had all their students test in English classes. They may have targeted students in English classes, or they said, we're just going to have our tier two and tier three students tested. Okay. How about the math testing? Math testing was all math mm -hmm. for our elementary. And at the middle school, it, it was tar more targeted, smaller, smaller numbers. Yes. Thank you. We used our math um, benchmark assessments for our middle school data. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more. Yes, Ms. Uh, Dr. Bass. So what type of information does the math inventory give teachers to aid students in their weak areas? Um, it's really going to look at their um, fluency in math, their ability to compute problem solving. There are certain categories that are listed. I don't have those in front of me, and I can get you those, Dr. Best. 
um, and you'll be able to find those in the data as well. But I don't, I don't have them. Lori, do you have them memorized? No, there's a fluency, and then it looks at all the strands, mm -hmm. like the computation and estimation. Mm -hmm. So it'll give an individual report for a student. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that the the RI and the MI dashboards, their reports for teachers, a wealth of information. There is so much you can gather from looking at a student report. And if you would like to see an individualized student report, that will not be in your data dashboard. Let us know. We will get you a few of them and let you both RI and MI will block out student names and we'll let you see how detailed they are and really how they tell the teacher what gaps you're missing in those foundational skills that enable you to move forward mathematically or through reading. Thank you. Yeah, one more thing. Yeah, one more? Yes, go ahead. Just who, who comes yeah. alongside the teachers to help them interpret the data that's there? Good question. It's a team of people. I mean, I think our data team did an amazing job of holding um, uh, a session for not only our building principals, but for central office as well. We sat through that. Our school support teams, we sit alongside of our principals. They, they sit with their admin teams, with their reading specialists, with their interventionists. They all look at that data. They break it down. Our teachers and PLCs work. We have our coaches that work with them with data. Our team leads get professional development from our supervisors. It trickles down. Um, the work is truly led by school leadership. They do an amazing job with this work. Our teaching and learning team supports them with that work. Um, it truly is a team effort. This is just, it, it takes so much, so many hands to really do this. And um, we're, I'm just so fortunate that we have such a good team here in Newport News. All right, uh, <clears throat> I'll just ask in relation to uh... Um, Madam Vice Chair, a question on reading specialists. Have all the reading specialists been through letters training? Um, so 100% yes. of them have all gone through. They go through it first. Unless they're new, okay. you know. Um, but yes, Lori was instrumental in making sure that we, so letters training requires a facilitator to pay for them, you know, the company to do it would be astronomical amount. So they do a train the trainer model and Lori was instrumental in making sure that our reading specialists were trained first and they have become our facilitators. Letters training is really going to be an ongoing process because we do have teachers flow ebb in and out of Newport News and in our budget we have a plan that um, establishes the money that's required for ongoing support through letters training. And then and just this is a great slide just to um, I think elaborate on in terms of the accreditation standard uh, and growth where do we need to be so we're at 38 percent now uh, where do we need to be um, how far do we need to go and if you could you know just uh, inform people who are watching um, you know at a mid-year point having a 38 percent how good is it how bad you know it's the mid-year point you know, we haven't even tested all the standards. It's a cumulative test. Um, with the diagnostic tools, it's just measuring growth. We are going to have a firm grasp of our students' SOL readiness, strand mastery, and their grade level readiness when we do the, the quarter three benchmarks. I think then we'll have a very firm handle of how our students are, are and as far as their readiness. And to piggyback off that off that response, one of the, one of our, our strategy also is to identify the retesters, the students who tested in the spring of last year and in the fall, because they're eligible for growth, right? So uh, to maximize that, identifying those students who are eligible for growth, in particular spring of last year, and make and seeing where they fall, where their data falls in terms of testing, because they will the ones who will get the, get the growth points as they as they show growth in the spring. Um, so knowing who those students are, knowing who students are in our subgroups, uh, that data being broken down. And our principals, the difference between the tool that you have and the tool that our principals have, they can drill down to the kit. So they can drill down specifically to the student and see where their date, where their scores are. They can, um, we all can categorize by subgroup. Uh, but they'll be looking at that data to identify growth uh, potential in their data uh, as we do the third quarter benchmarking because um, Remember with benchmarks, this the mid-year benchmark was about maybe 50% of the content of the course. The third quarter benchmark is going to be almost the majority of content. So now you really have a good good assessment of where kids are in terms of their readiness to pass the SOL test um, based on the third quarter benchmark. And that will be given 
Oh, we're going to be probably break. the end of quarter three or mm -hmm. the beginning of quarter four, depending on the window. Right. And just pointing what Dr. Parker said, this really drives how, you know, how we are going to target which students need what by really drilling down by the strand and item descriptor and grouping kids accordingly and giving them the supports needed to address that particular area. What is your weakness? How do I target it? And how do we ensure that you have another option for mastery? So, so, so a student, when they go to a study block, is not just getting, they're not they're just getting all the same thing. What they're getting during that SOL um, practice time is they're getting specific content that's related to their to their data. So if they're weak in strand in a certain strand, they'll get activities in, in that specific strand and they'll be retested in that strand to make sure that until they show content mastery. And my last question is just a logistical question in relation to the previous tool versus this one. In the previous one, I haven't, of course, logged into the new one. We had we had a student growth and assessment, and we had the math and reading inventory. We had the scores they were going up, being updated quarterly. We had PALS, chronic absenteeism, and then the graduation and college career and citizen readiness index. Are all of those, those have been migrated over to the new tool, or when will they get migrated to the new tool? That was that a That'll take a little bit of time. What you see in that guide was just meant to be an example. Um, as we continue to incorporate more data, migrate more data, we'll definitely be able to share those out with the board. Yep. And not only that, but one thing that you guys also need to note is that in the future, probably within the next week or so, each individual board member will get an individualized login and password to this particular dashboard. Okay. And uh, the data will be updated quarterly as, as Correct. Before. So Correct. when we're looking at it currently, this will be, we'll be looking at second quarter results. Correct. Okay. Is the old tool obsolete at this point, or would is, does it is it still populated with data? Power BI. Mm -hmm. um, that is currently not being updated at this time. We are transitioning to okay. Tableau. That's just good information yeah. to have. Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And, and just to preface, we transitioned from Power BI to Tableau because the state was working on a project for the, a data dashboard and they're using Tableau. So it just makes sense, just in case in the future that's what they're using, we want to align that. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, now we move on to 5.03, our special education annual plan. And that's Dr. Mitchell. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Vice Chair Searles Law, Board Members, and Dr. Parker. I'm Michelle Mitchell, Executive Director for the Department of Student Advancement. Tonight's presentation is an annual requirement to inform the Board of the proposed spending plan for funds allocated by the federal government based on the requirements that are outlined in the application. Local education agencies are always required to submit this application each year, and it is pursuant to the federal provisions of the Individuals with Disabilities Act of 2004, as well as some state regulations governing special education and related services for students with disabilities. But prior to the submission to the state of this plan, the Virginia Department of Education requires that the local division present this plan to the local school board for your approval, but we also have to have it reviewed by the local special education advisory committee. So I will present it next week to the SEAC is what we call them, special education advisory committee. We have some statements of assurance that we must go over with you. So we are required to assure that we are providing a free appropriate public education. So we can't, for example, ask a parent whose child needs a specialized chair or any specialized equipment to pay for that. We are required to ensure that it is free for them and that we um, assume the cost. We also must assure that each student's program is designed for them, which is documented in an IEP, and that students are educated in an inclusive environment to the extent that their educational programming permits. And finally, we must maintain a structure that prevents the over-identification of special education in general and the over-identification in specific subgroups. 
So I've listed for you what the 13 categories are. Now I've come to you in the past and we didn't have students in each category, but this year we are currently serving students in each of the 13 disability categories. Wow. Our federal funding is based on the number of students with disabilities being served on December 1st. So we run a report, we send it to the State Department based on the number of students with an active IEP December the 1st, that's what the funding from this grant comes from. On December the 1st, 2021, we were serving a total of 3,594 students with disabilities. So that's what we were funded on. Currently though, we are serving 3,686 students, which reflects an increase of 92 students since December the 1st. In addition to the assurances, the annual plan requires that the division submit information on expenditures and some selected programs. For maintenance of effort, which is one of these additional components, we must ensure that we are spending the same amount from this grant on special education supports as we did the previous year. Or we can spend more, we just can't spend less. Included in the selected programs is the local jail program, which services uh, are provided for in, by endorsed special education teachers to students with disabilities who are in course, or incarcerated. So if we have any students with an IEP who are currently incarcerated, we do have um, endorsed teachers who are right there at the facility who are providing their special education services. Another component of the plan is the supports for students with disabilities who are parentally placed in private school. And this includes homeschooled students. So as a parent, if you opt to put your child in a private school or you opt to homeschool your child, we still offer some special education services. It's important to note that the administrators of the private schools collaborate with our staff to identify the provisions of special education services that will be made available to the parentally placed students. In previous years, the administrators in conjunction with our staff have opted to offer speech language services to those students who are found eligible. In addition, we also collaborate with the parentally placed private um, school students uh, administrators to offer professional development. So in other words, if there, we have students who are receiving special education services in a private school, we offer that those teachers can attend our professional development. And sometimes they will even call us to say, we'd like to know more about this. Can you provide a professional development for us? And we, we of course, provide that for them. We also assist families with child find. And if you're not familiar with child find, we are mandated by the state to evaluate any student if someone assumes or um, thinks that the child may have a disability. So we have uh, parents who call us that say, I think my child may have a disability, what do I do? So we evaluate those students. We have doctors that call us to say, I think this student has a disability. The parent will be calling you. Please look into that. So that's considered child find. So we work with the parentally, parentally placed private schools to do the child find. The last component, of course, is the funding expenditures. It is separated in two sections. Title VI B, which are funds for pre-K through 12th grade, and then Title VI C, which is for preschool special education only. State, federal, and local funding support the special education program in its entirety. Now, I put that statement in there because I want to make sure that the public understands that this is not the only funding that we have for special education. You know, we have funding that comes from the local budget as well. Title VI B, and 6C represents 6.7 million of the overall funding. So we are proposing to continue to utilize this 6.7 million funding for personnel, which includes a parent resource coordinator, which by the way is required by the state, and extended school year services for those qualifying students. So we are asking that we continue to use this funding to pay for teachers, um, interpret sign language interpreters, uh, social workers, um, 
the parent coordinator, um, instructional assistants that are that are vitally needed in the classroom. So out of this funding in the past, we have been able to hire approximately 126 individuals to support our students. So I wouldn't come up here without trying to give us a little bit of glows. That's just about the funding plan. So we're asking that you um, consider uh, the funding that we are requesting or being given from the state and that we would continue to use that for personnel. But I do want to close this presentation by highlighting some of the outcomes of the hard work of our student staff and families. We know this has been a very challenging year for all students, for staff and families, but we do have some glows. So I want to share with you that through Project Search, which is one of our programs, we, we are able to provide our students with authentic experiences to develop workplace skills. So in partnership with Centera Hospital and Fort Eustis, we have interns, students with disabilities, and through their internship in this program, we're able to boast 87% success rate with gaining employment for our students at the completion of this. Now, across the country, you will note that uh, individuals with disabilities, that is one of the largest unemployed uh, population. So we are proud to say that as our students who are exiting at the end of the year that are in Project Search, 87% of them have been gainfully employed at the completion of it. We are really proud to say that already this year, one of our current students has been offered a full-time job that includes health care and retirement benefits. So we're really excited about that. We also have a partnership with the, the Virginia Department of Education's MOVE Transition Program that has provided expanded opportunities for our students to learn about post-secondary options through guest speakers and on-campus tours at local universities. We have also partnered this year extensively with the Special Education Training and Technical Assistance Center at Old Dominion University and the College of William and Mary to provide our staff with targeted professional development in the areas of literacy, math, positive behavior supports, and assistive technology. So that's an additional support that we have in addition to the supervisors that provide professional development right here. We've reached out to Old Dominion as well as the College of William and Mary, and we're really excited. Some of our professional developments that have been virtual in partnership with these two universities have had 98 staff members that have logged in and have stayed the entire time. Um, so that's that says a lot when you can log off when you want to. So we're really excited about that partnership. Another thing that we are very excited about is the fact that we make every effort to support our parents. So as you noticed in the presentation regarding the funding, the state requires that we have a parent resource coordinator. So our parent resource coordinator con connects our families with a variety of resources to enhance their knowledge and understanding of special education, including access to community workshops. So on the screen, I just have a couple of the workshops that our parents have been able to attend because our parent uh, resource coordinator has connected them with this. Our coordinator is also available to respond to any parent questions and to support them through the educational process. And lastly, here are some highlights on student progress. So we went into the dashboard as Dr. Manglamont described very nicely to you. And so we want to just highlight two additional schools. So at Knollwood Meadows, Meadows uh, scores on the reading inventory for students with disabilities reflected that 18% eight, of students with disabilities have moved into a higher reading band from the beginning of the year to mid-year. So we're really excited about that 18% increase at this school. Um, additionally, by mid-year, 19% of students with disabilities at BC Charles have moved into a higher math achievement level based on their results from the math inventory. So again, we're trending in the right direction. We are providing our teachers with the support and the resources that they need to assist our students. During our next board meeting on April 19th, we will be seeking your approval of the proposed plan and will submit it to the Virginia Department of Education no later than May 14th. Your approval of this plan will enable us to continue providing support 
um, staff in order to support the continued growth of our students with disabilities. So this concludes my presentation and I am happy to provide additional information if needed. Questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you. Very nice. And we'll move on to item 5.04, our new and revised policies. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Parker. It's a pleasure to share highlights from 10 new and revised policies and procedures with you this evening, which will also include the start of our policy chapter review for this year. As you know, one of the major roles of the school division is to, of the school board, is to set the policy direction for the school division. So we're fortunate to have two board members on our policy committee, Dr. Best and Mrs. Amen, along with a principal from each level, administrators from the Department of Teaching and Learning and the Office of School Leadership, a teacher, two attorneys, and myself as the policy administrator. The first policy that I will highlight this evening is on administering medications to students, which we are revising to reflect changes in recent state legislation. And following that policy, I will review our instruction policy chapter. Since that chapter has over 100 policies, procedures, and exhibits combined, we divided our review into three groups. So this evening, I will share the first group of the Instruction Policy Chapter 4 review. Now, we're starting the evening by revising our administering medications to students policy to reflect new state legislation that requires our schools to have albuterol inhalers to use in administering albuterol to any student experiencing respiratory distress. The purpose the purpose of the new requirement is to reduce the amount of time students spend away from the classroom and to make schools safer for students. We also developed a new procedure or protocol for using albuterol and it details how the staff will be trained to store and administer the medication. And now to our policy chapter review. You may recall that in the fall of 2020, we began the systematic review of our 11 policy chapters over a five-year period while continuing to develop or update the policies that may be required by state and federal law each year. So this evening, we are excited to begin the review of the fourth policy chapter in our timeline, which is on instruction. And as I mentioned earlier, given the size of the chapter, we've divided it into three groups, and we will share the first group with you this evening. I would like to thank our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Ting Mangamont, and her staff for sharing their expertise so that we could complete this important work. So the Policy Committee reviewed approximately 32 documents, including 23 policies and nine procedures and exhibits in the chapter. We made revisions to 22 policies, procedures, and exhibits. Now, while some of the revisions were minor edits to position titles and program names, Others were to streamline the policy language and to align the policies to new state standards, our strategic plan, Journey 2025, and to new school division practices. So I'd like to highlight just a few of the policies and procedures that were revised. The first policy in the chapter was totally revised to reflect the school division's instructional goals and learning objectives that align the school board's commitment to Journey 2025, the NMPS profile of a learner, and the state standards of learning. The new language emphasizes content knowledge, workplace learning skills, community engagement and civic responsibility, and career exploration. Next. We expanded our current policy on the quality of the instructional program to address the quality of instruction that the school division provides students to ensure that they receive a well-rounded education that meets or exceeds the Virginia standards of learning. The updated policy reflects the school division's emphasis on authentic and engaging instructional activities that foster creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication, and citizenship. 
our five C's, engagement in career exploration and opportunities for work-based learning experiences, and equitable access to programs such as magnet programs, career and technical pathways, dual enrollment, early college, advanced placement, international baccalaureate, and our virtual learning academy. In this next policy, which addresses the length and other requirements for the school year and the school day, we added the state provision that allows the school board to waive the 140 hour clock requirement for high school credit if the class covers all of the content and skills included in the re relevant standards of learning. So to do this, the school division must demonstrate that the content of the course is comparable to 140 hours of instruction and meets the objectives of the course. We also updated the procedure to add that the school board may revise the school calendar during the school year as circumstances warrant while following the state code requirements. So next, in keeping with our current practice, we added language to the, I think we're, yes. We added language to the academic day policy to allow the superintendent to authorize early closings, delayed openings, and other adjustments to the length of the school day, as long as they comply with state requirements for the total number of instructional hours or days. This is important in allowing the school division the flexibility to provide programs such as our virtual learning academy. Now, the school division provides homebound instruction to eligible students who medical needs, be they physical, emotional, prevent them from attending school regularly for an extended period of time. So for clarification, we added text to the policy to emphasize that homebound instruction provides an instructional link with the school in order to facilitate the student's return to the physical classroom as soon as possible. The language that language that we added also states that homebound instruction provides priority to core academic subjects and does not guarantee specialty classes or elective courses. Now, our policy on home instruction, which we often call homeschooling, states that the school division will follow the guidelines from the Virginia Department of Education for parents who wish to educate their students at home. We revised the policy to make it more reader friendly in addressing the school division's responsibility to develop procedures for processing home instruction requests for monitoring the student's educational progress, for providing college placement test information, and for coordinating the process for students who wish to transfer from home instruction to the classroom. Our next policy focuses on the school division's adult education program, which provides courses in academics and workforce development. The policy was expanded to include information on the National External Diploma Program, which leads to an adult high school diploma. Our adult education program administers the National Diploma, which includes a performance assessment system that evaluates the reading, writing, math, and work force readiness skills of participants and then provides a self-paced and flexible program for adults who are comfortable working independently towards the diploma. Now the purpose of this last policy and procedure is to establish guidelines for instructional and student activity field trips that are extensions of academic, athletic, and other student activities. So to provide greater clarity, we added definitions to the policy for an instructional field trip, a student activity field trip, and for regional and extended field trips. The procedure to the policy was streamlined by removing teacher trip checklist and other other information already required on field trip request forms. So in terms of our next steps, the revised policies will come before the school board for action at your April 19th meeting. And once approved, the revised policies, procedures, and exhibits will be posted on our school division websites and disseminated to our schools and public libraries. So this concludes my report this evening. And joining me to respond to questions is our lead expert on instruction, who you heard earlier this evening, Dr. Manglamont. So thank you.
All right, well, thank you, Ms. Brooks. And uh, so we all have a lot of reading to do between now and next month. Yes, we do. So uh, all the board members will direct our questions to Dr. Parker, as I'm sure there's going to be numerous questions. So uh, we have 30 days to uh, get our questions to Dr. Parker. Great. Thank you. All right, so the, uh, next on our agenda is 5.05, the attendance report. 5.06, the membership report. 5.07, construction report. Board members, you receive copies of these reports. Do you have any questions on them at this time? All right. Hearing none, then we'll move on to 5.08, comments by the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a few accolades to uh, put it, give, uh, give uh, some shout outs to a few of our schools and students this evening. So I will have a short, uh, short comments, but I think they're well deserved. Um, Three NNPS archery teams and three individual archers are advancing to the National Archery Tournament in Louisville, Kentucky in May after sweeping the state tournament in, on March 12th. Congratulations to the Rich Neck Elementary Archery Team for placing second in the state and to the BC Charles Elementary Team who earned third place. Of note were two Rich Neck students who swept first and second place in the state for their individual scores. Addison uh, Williamson won first place while Hadesia Bates took second place in the state tournament. They will join the Rich Neck team in national competition. Uh, the Gildersleeve Archery team placed third in the state and the Minchville team earned fourth place. Three individual archers from BC Charles qualified to compete as individuals at nationals, Ryan Washington, Alyssa Wright, and Peyton Telfair. Congratulations to these students and their coaches. I'd also like to congratulate the six elementary and middle school robotics teams who recently participated in the Lego, Lego League Robotics Regional Competitions last month. Teams from Crittenden, Booker T. Washington, and Passage Middle Schools, and Katherine Johnson, Deer Park, and Sedgefield Elementary worked collaboratively to research and offer a solution to a real issue involving the transportation of cargo. The teams built their model and designed processes to address and resolve their transportation issue. The Newport News um, Robotics Program had the largest percentage of teams competing in the event across the region. Yay. Congratulations to the Booker T. Washington Middle School team who won the Core Values Award and the team from Mary Passage Middle who earned the Judges Choice Award. And also congratulations to one of our principals, Dr. Dara White, principal of Newsom Park Elementary School who earned an Everyday Hero Award by Channel 3. Uh, Dr. White was honored for making sure her students have a solid foundation for lifelong learning. She was presented with a certificate and a $300 gift card. Dr. White had, um, was presented with the award during a book fair sponsored by the TV station where every student was able to select five books of their own to take home. We'd like to congratulate Dr. White on this well-deserved recognition. And lastly, I was reminded to families and staff on Friday, April 1st, um, it will be a virtual learning day for all students. And April 4th through the 8th, yay, is spring break. So all schools and offices will be closed. I wish everyone a happy spring break. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Uh, so we're all really great uh, things happening. So we'll move on now to item six, which is another opportunity to hear from the public. Madam Clerk, do we have any cards? Okay. All right. There being no cards, then uh, to my, my left, we have some birthdays. I'll acknowledge Mr. Ely, Mr. Hunter. And Dr. Parker, uh, all had birthdays this month, so happy birthday. March baby. Wish you happy birthday to all of you. Uh, yeah. What you got, what we got you for your birthday was a budget. And Mr. Wright. <laughs> and Mr. Wright. <laughs> oh, and, and Mr. Uh, Wright. Yeah, and Mr. Too. Wright. So happy birthday to you yeah. as well. And uh, with, somewhere around. And uh, with that, we'll stand adjourned. <laughs> Thank you.